In April 121 AD, a boy named Marcus is born. And Marcus Aurelius is, is not born to royal blood. He's born to an upper class, uh, well-respected family. And yet, at the same time, no one would have predicted that he would go on not only to be emperor, but to be perhaps the only example of a philosopher king in, in all of human history. It's an incredible story of luck, but also of someone turning that luck into incredible greatness and majesty. Marcus is not born anywhere close to the throne. He has no relatives who are emperor, who have royal blood. It's that at some point he shows enough talent and enough skill that the emperor Hadrian, who has no heir, makes the incredible decision to select Marcus Aurelius to rule most of the known world. And he does it not just in terms of, uh, of just selecting him, he selects another man, Antoninus Pius. So basically what Hadrian does is Hadrian adopts Antoninus Pius, who in turn adopts Marcus Aurelius. And this sets in motion a succession plan that guides and trains and prepares Marcus Aurelius for a thing that should be impossible to prepare a human for. It prepares Marcus Aurelius to hold absolute power. I think Hadrian probably thought that Antoninus Pius would rule for a few years, and then Marcus in his early 20s or 30s would take over. He didn't think that it would be almost two decades, and that Marcus would be tutored by this modest, self-effacing, but deeply dedicated public servant who teaches him how to be great. And, and you can't read meditations and not see over and over and over again just all the things that Marcus learns from Antoninus and how he shapes him. But there were other guides too. Junius Rusticus is the philosopher who introduces Marcus to Stoic philosophy. He loans Marcus Aurelius a copy of Epictetus's discourses from his own library. And we don't know, Junius Rusticus may have attended Epictetus's lectures himself, or this may be a copy of the notes done by a fellow student named Arian. But this book recommendation is the book recommendation that, that changes Marcus Aurelius's life. Uh, Joseph Campbell talks about the hero's journey, but a key part of the hero's journey is the arrival of the mentor, the guide who teaches the hero what they can be and what they need to know to seize and accomplish their destiny. So, so Marcus gets the call to adventure, Hadrian selecting him to be emperor, but it's Antoninus Pius and it's Junius Rusticus and it's Sextus and Fronto, Marcus's teachers who make him who he is capable of becoming. And this is a critical part in our own journeys. Who is our Obi-Wan, right? Who is our Yoda? Who is the teacher that is guiding us on our journey? to who we can be. For me, it was, it was Robert Greene. Robert Greene makes me a writer, makes me a thinker, gives me so many tools that I use on a day-to-day -day basis. Even the, the conversations we've had about Stoicism have changed the course of my life. And yet there were also the mentors in the books that I read, Marcus Aurelius being one, Seneca being another. Epictetus's Discourse is the same book that changes Marcus's life is, is the book that changes my life. Marcus does a number of things that are totally unprecedented. He's actually a good king, like the, the absolute power does not corrupt, absolutely. Arius Didymus is actually the first Stoic philosopher to advise the emperor. He advises the young uh, Octavian who becomes Augustus. And there's a tricky, similar situation to Marcus Aurelius's, which is that Caesarian, one of Caesar's illegitimate children, is still alive in Egypt. And as, as Octavian rises to power, this is a tricky thing, right? You can't have more than one claim to the throne. And Arius supposedly jokes to him, one cannot have too many Caesars, he says. And so Caesarian is killed. So what do you expect Marcus Aurelius to do? Would he have followed the path of Nero, who in Seneca's time dispatches one by one, not just his rivals to the throne, but any relative who might possess even the slightest threat to him or question him in any way. Nero has, has murdered brutally, including his own mother. The track record here is bloody and, and awful. And what does Marcus Aurelius do when he becomes emperor? 
He names his brother Lucius Verus, not even his actual brother, but his stepbrother, really, his adopted stepbrother, Marcus Aurelius names co-emperor. The first thing Marcus does with absolute power is give half of it away. It's, it, it's, it's unimaginable, and yet that's what he does. And time after time in Marcus's reign, he just does the exact opposite of what you would expect someone in that position to do. Marcus Aurelius hates the gladiatorial games. He thinks they're violent and awful. Um, he still has to attend, but he demands that the gladiators be given wooden swords so they can't hurt each other. He passes laws protecting the slaves, protecting the poor. At the depths of the Antonine Plague, uh, when, when he has so much on his mind and Rome is reeling from the financial crisis that comes along with the Antonine Plague, what does Marcus do? Marcus walks through the Imperial Palace and sets aside his most valuable treasures to be sold at auction on the lawn of the palace to pay off Rome's debts. He even burns the record books that show uh, who owes money to the state. He, he even after the, the economy recovers, refuses even to ask for the return of the treasures. He doesn't care about these things. He cares about people. More than 80 times in meditations, he talks about serving the public good. The fruit of this life, he says, is good character and acts for the common good. It's just unreal, but this is what philosophy taught him. This is what his mentors guided him towards. This is what he learned from Antoninus. Marcus isn't threatened by uh, his subordinates. He, he surrounds himself with smart people. He isn't even threatened by flawed people. He tries, as one historian tells us, to put anyone who could be of service to the empire in a position where they could do good. And he tries not to hold their flaws against them. Even when Marcus's best friend mounts a coup and tries to have Marcus killed, Marcus not only uh, doesn't respond in anger, he demands that the Senate not sentence a single participant to death. He says, let my reign not be stained by blood, let it never happen. So it's really just this incredible story and it starts really in his boyhood. It starts that he shows this little bit of potential, but he's groomed and trained and introduced to philosophy and that philosophy makes him who he's capable of being. In the middle of the pandemic, I started telling this story to my son. I said, this is the story of the boy who would be king. This is the story of how Marcus Aurelius became not just an emperor, but the greatest emperor to ever live. And we went over piece by piece the, the, the great moments of Marcus's life. He, he doesn't think he's gonna be up for it. And then he has a dream. He has a dream that his shoulders are made of ivory and on it rests the cloak of the emperor. This is how he knows he actually does have what it takes to answer the call, to go on the hero's journey. And I, it's just an, a story that inspires me so much, that I love so much. And so in this new book, The Boy Who Would Be King, it's really a fable, an illustrated fable about one of the greatest stories of all time. How does Marcus Aurelius become a philosopher king? How does he become the person that philosophy wants him to be despite all the temptations, despite all the distractions, despite the historical pull of the gravity that might have taken him away from that. And that's really what this new book is about. That's, that's the story I want to leave with people. I worked with this great illustrator, Victor Juhas, who did these beautiful illustrations that show the story. I want it to be a story we remember that we don't forget that sort of imprints itself in our muscle memory, whether you're an adult, whether you're about to become uh, the president of a company or whether you're a six year old boy and your father or your mother is reading this story to you at bedtime. That's what I'm trying to do with The Boy Who Would Be King. That's my thinking now with this new book. I'm so excited to share it with you guys. I think, again, Marcus Aurelius' life is one of the most incredible, unparalleled lives in all of human history. It's one we have to learn from. It's one we can study. It's one we can hold up as a model for who we want to be, who we want to help our kids be like. I'm excited to put this new book out in the world. I can't wait for you to read it. The Boy Who Would Be King, it's available everywhere. You can get it on our site. We even have signed copies. Of all the things I've done, this is the one I'm most proud of, and I can't wait for you to see it.